While I only have one Stanhope here, Nichette Butler, I wish I had more because they are amazingly rewarding beautiful orchids that have blooms of such incredible beauty and intricacy. While short-lived, the mind is blown by the blooms they have, and if that's not enough to take the senses into a happy spiral, then their fragrances will definitely have you hypnotized and convinced that, even if space is limited, a single Stanhopia really is a must-have orchid. The care? It's not as complicated as it may seem on paper, so let's cover the basics, and then I will go into a little more detail on just how tolerant this genus is, because if I can grow mine in my climate, then anyone can grow them. The genus Stanhopia abbreviates to Stan. For that reason, the one and only Stanhopia in my collection is called Stan the Man, and boy does he live up to his name. He is a tough guy. He flexes and he is tolerant of everything that is thrown at him. Strong is something else that comes to mind. Anyway, speaking of general care, to give an idea of the baseline requirements for Stanhopia, let's start with light. Because while it is fun growing this genus, if we don't have the important ingredient of light, none of our orchids will bloom and that is true for Stanhopias as well. Light should be bright with direct sunlight diffused so as not to burn the leaves. Most growers suspend these orchids due to their pendulous flower spikes. The preferred and best light levels are those that are very, very close to cattleya light, but not direct sun as can be the case with cattleyas because the leaves are not strong enough to withstand the heat even if there is sufficient airflow. Temperatures should be moderate, the mean being 11 degrees at night, with day temperatures of around 22 degrees Celsius. While Stanhopias can stand short spells of higher temperatures, air movement, humidity and shading must all be increased. Many species flower in the summer and putting them outside in the summer may be beneficial. Move into higher light though slowly to avoid burning the leaves. I will elaborate on my temperature range in my climate a little further into the video, but you can tell that they are already quite tolerant of extreme lows and extreme high temperatures, and I am in southern Spain. Meaning, my summers are super hot, and the lack of humidity these cloud forest orchids love is non-existent. Preferably, humidity should be above 60% all year round, as a minimum. When it comes to the needs of Stanhopia health and humidity is not available in those high percentages all year round, they are tolerant in lower humidity conditions if balanced out with the watering regime. A great go-to thought is to remember that the genus is a cloud forest lover where there is plenty of fog which holds moisture and we can work with adding moisture if we water in ample quantities. This is important to produce strong pseudobulbs and prevent foliar spotting and leaf crinkling. Stanhopias and their relatives can be sensitive to salt accumulation in the medium, so should never be allowed to dry out entirely even during the winter months when growth may slow or stop. Poor watering habits are also conducive to root loss and some may be very slow to re-establish once they have lost their roots. Fertilize at regular intervals. These orchids are hungry not only when in active growth, but also during the conditions where their temperatures exceed their preferences. I recommend always providing something of substance to these orchids because they will need something to draw from during the less favorable conditions to maintain their structures healthy. Established Stanhopias can also be grown using slow-release fertilizer, which reduces the applications depending on what the manufacturer's instructions are. Potting up or repotting is done best right after summer blooming, as most plants seem to grow year-round. Plants that rest in the winter can be repotted in spring, and there is no winter rest where they are in their natural habitat, but our conditions and our culture may force them to slow down, and we would think they are resting. So while they're slowed down, don't think that this is a good time to deal with any repotting. In cases of adverse conditions, just wait until after the blooming, then they kick into active growth, which I will elaborate further in the video. 
The best bloomings on Stanhopias come from large clumps of plants, so large baskets are usually used. An airy yet moist medium seems to work best, such as medium-grade fir bark, often mixed with sphagnum moss or cocoa husk fibers. Vigorous plants may need repotting every three years or so, depending on your setup, your media, your watering, how high your humidity is in your environment. Before I go into how I deal with my Stanhopia, however, in conditions that do not match what I just outlined, please take a moment to like the video and share it out to anyone you may know that could benefit from the information. It really does help the channel out and supports me in the algorithm. Thank you so, so much. So with all that being said, let's take the general out of the way and let me tell you about the tolerance of my stan if the mentioned conditions are not something that you can provide or temperatures and humidity are not within the parameters of your grow space or climate should not put you off considering stanhopias in your collection as mine is a hybrid and it came with a wrong name once it bloomed out michael mccarthy was so kind as to provide me with the id from there, I had to check the parentage out because Stanhopias have a habit of growing in beast mode once they settle into their new home. The parentage did not provide any contradicting care requirements, so it wasn't as if I had conflicting information where one parent is stronger and more demanding of conditions that I do not have. Sometimes hybrids can have two parents that are polar opposites of each other when it comes to care. But the Stanhopia genus is pretty equal in its needs across the board that there's no interference in the care when it comes to hybrids, which is a massive bonus seeing as we can treat them pretty much all the same. Now, Stanhopias are classified as warm growers, but the reality is that mine can go as low as 5 degrees Celsius, which is far from warm. While the general care also states that Stanhopias cannot tolerate temperatures higher than 23 degrees Celsius, mine lives outside and can handle temperatures up to 40 degrees Celsius with little to no humidity to speak of. However, the reason it is able to cope with those high temperatures is because I put so much water into its basket during those conditions. That cools the orchid down and I have her in bright shade throughout the weeks where these extreme temperatures occur. Even the airflow during those weeks isn't exactly effective at cooling the orchid down, but the watering does. So those are the pointers that I would recommend to anyone who says their conditions are too harsh, they are too dry, they cannot provide cloud forest type humidity. I have as yet to find the point of too much water for my Stanhopia. Personally, I don't think that there is such a thing but let me know in the comments if you disagree and would like to put out a warning sign with regards to how much water a Stanhopia can tolerate. Because if I'm not pouring a jug of water through the basket on a daily basis during the hottest months of the year, we'll get to that. I am definitely misting this orchid every single day and not just a slight misting. I soak it by misting. You may also say, well, my orchid isn't as big as yours. So, of course, the watering goes hand in hand with the size of the orchid. And unless we talk about how big the Stanhopia in question is, because, of course, if it comes as a seedling, then the quantity of water and fertilization should match the seedling as opposed to what I'm providing for my mature one. However, the media should never really dry out, even for a seedling, because with everything regarding Stanhopias, we have to remember that we are still dealing with size. A seedling stand is already needing to support larger structures, so that is something to keep in mind. Whenever a stand pushes out a new growth, you will want to water and fertilize without fail, or else you will get the wrinkling on the leaves straight away, and they cannot be ironed out, even once the watering is sufficient and dialed in. The leaves should be smooth, only displaying their ridges, which is natural for them, but not wrinkly. The crinkled leaves can also occur if the growth gets stuck when it is trying to push through the basket liner, as in my case, the hob filter material was too dense, so the symptoms can appear even if you're providing sufficient water, which of course brings us back to ensuring an airy mix that does not impede in any growth's progress. I have come to accept my crinkled leaves as they are also a visual reminder of just how much water this orchid needs and it helps me not to forget. 
I fertilize my Stan the Man at 300 parts per million with a balanced fertilizer that is orchid specific at every watering during the summer and follow that up with a flush of plain water during the course of the day before the basket dries out. This way I do not risk any salt accumulation in the basket which once again will take out the roots. When it rains, whatever time of year, my stan is exposed to the rain as well, which is another excellent flush, even if new growths are on the way. So despite all that, even if it has been raining, I have to water my stan every day during the summer, so it is constantly being fertilized. I also give it calcium and magnesium supplements to make sure that nothing rots as the new growths appear through the moss. While my CalMag supplementation may appear to be at the low end of 100 parts per million, I do pour a jug over the media two times a week, which has proven sufficient so far. For the size of the orchid, you are probably thinking my parts per million are way too low. It happens every day. I fertilize 300 parts per million every day per week. So we are up there in the numbers when it comes to the fertilizing amount this orchid gets, based on its size, of course. However, during the cooler months of the year, I go with half strength on my fertilizer, making that 160 parts per million or thereabouts. I maintain my CalMac at 100 parts per million only once a month though, because I'm relying on the summer regime to have put strength into the structures that during the winter they would just benefit from a top up. I mix seaweed into the CalMag at 40 parts per million just to give it a boost. Not that this orchid <laughs> needs a boost, but because it is such fun to grow and will respond to anything that is a boost, like a beast, <laughs> I add seaweed. But that stops once we are already heading into colder months of the year and after the second flush of new growths is already starting to show signs of maturity. Second flush of new growths, you ask? <laughs> Yes, you heard correctly. Stanhopias will show signs of new growth starting while the spikes are just starting to bloom and that is the first flush. And then once the first flush of new growth start to leaf out, there is another flush of new growths coming, which is just insane because if you love to water your orchids and if you love seeing vigor without feeling as though everything is going so slow, this genus is so much fun. It's just absorb, absorb and drink and drink and grow and grow. Insane, but so much fun. Mine grows 13 new growths per year. And when it was double the size, it grew 18 new growths in the first two years it was with me as a non-blooming size Stanhopia before I divided it. Yes, what you are looking at is half a Stanhopia after four years so be prepared to have a lot of space for them to grow and fill more than just a corner. Maybe your chandelier will need to go. <laughs> anyway, also keep in mind that Stanhopias will grow new growths from anywhere around its perimeter. We may be able to determine a main direction of growth, but it won't take long that you will have multiple directions of growth and not just sideways, but going down, vertical, horizontal, you name it. Visually, think of your stand as a ball and your basket is nothing but the center of the ball. This will help you be prepared for what is to come. Growth coming from every angle and unexpected angles at that. Same with the flower spikes. Ideally, they should come out from the bottom of the basket because if that happens, the blooms will have no problem opening up. However, a Stanhopia is unpredictable when it comes to the flower spikes as well. They come from all sides as the orchid ages and gets larger. One thing that I've come to understand when it comes to Stanhopia flower spikes is do not touch them while they are still in a pointed spear shape. They take a long time to progress. So when you see a spear and you're a tactile orchid grower, don't touch because they will fail at that stage. If you see a spike emerging and it is caught up against the basket or cannot protrude through the media, you may try to carefully remove the media to allow the spike to develop. But more often than not, that single interference will cause the spike to fail and just dry up. It is the weirdest thing. I have no proof that it happens with all stands, but I have seen it happening to other Stanhopias that are not the same as mine and have experienced the same thing with mine 
over the course of the years that mine was growing spikes and I just wanted to tear a little bit of the hob material away from the spike to help out and boom, that spike just dried up as if I had touched it with some kind of venom. It's incredible, very, very sensitive. The spike did not just stop growing, but it literally dried up in its shape. It didn't show any bruising, nothing. I'll repeat myself, it dried up as it was finito. So don't touch your spikes when they start growing. Now, because I've learned all that, I leave the spikes to either make it or not. Even if the blooms are squashed up against the basket, as was the case in 2022. Unfortunately, they did not open to their full beauty. Uh, to a degree, I managed then to lift a bloom up over the edge of the basket. But the display, the show was impeded by what I thought was a shallow basket. <laughs> the spike grew and grew right up against the mesh. However, I could still enjoy their fragrance, but it was just one of those situations where interference would have stopped the spike in its tracks. For the length of your stand being in a basket, hanging or propped up on a stand as mine is currently, know that eventually it will create its own microclimate and this is awesome when it does that, regardless of how you grow yours. Basically, looking back, the media I used was only there to help the humidity microclimate around the plant for a year until it had settled in. Now, the moss is taking over and the ferns are growing. The orchid is lifting herself out of the shallow basket. All something that I encourage because now there is a much higher humidity than I could ever provide. I try to maintain the moss and fern for as long as possible. And sometimes I am successful, sometimes I'm not. With an average of 30% humidity in my climate, keeping moss and ferns happy is not my first priority, but it is an indicator that I keep an eye on because the Stanhopia now somewhat depends on it as well. It is a health indicator giving me an insight into how the climate is coping, how much is the humidity failing, how much more do I need to water during the very, very hot months of the year. Now you might say, wow, those pseudobulbs are really buried deep in the moss. Uh, what about rot? Hmm, in my dry climate, that is not an issue, but I would advise against it happening in an environment that has sufficient humidity of 60% and up consistently. While it is pretty, and should that happen in your case, under those high humidity circumstances, I would recommend to keep the moss in check and remove it around the vicinity of the pseudobulbs, keeping in mind that there is root growth happening in and around that moss as well. So it is a little bit of a delicate maneuver to be picking away at the pseudobulbs. Fortunately, I am getting away with it. However, I would like to just point out it could be an issue in very high humidity conditions. On the plus side though, Stanhopias do not have a reputation of rotting easily. However, in the orchid hobby, we cannot rely on the rule of averages. Something that does not happen in one person's method of growing may happen with the other person's method of growing. So I just wanted to point that out. It is a good idea to stay on top of the new growths, keep them free of anything that could be a threat of rot until you see what your environment holds and how your stand can handle it. In the general care, we discussed light levels in general. The light levels that my stand has to tolerate during the summers are bordering on burning the leaves. I do not think that the sun it gets during those months together with the airflow where it hangs helps to keep the leaves from burning, but I have burned leaves before. It is an unfortunate side effect of living in a hot, dry climate, and sometimes I purposely sacrifice the sun exposure on an older leaf to protect and provide shade for a new leaf that is growing, so I kinda double a little bit with what is presented to me. Where it hangs during the summer, it does get a lot of direct sun. Not always do I have any wind to speak of that is cooling. It is also hot, dry wind, so I can't get around it. The size of the orchid has its limitations within the perimeters of the patio as well, <laughs> which is quite astonishing. So keep that in mind. When you consider adding Stanhopias to your collection, that size will become an issue very, very quickly. And that is something we want to encourage, but also something we have to consider accommodating. Now the leaf tip dieback you see on my stand currently, those are old leaves dying back. And that is a process that can take months to complete before the leaf pops off easily and leaves the pseudobulb behind. 
the pseudobulb in my Stanhopias, the ones that I can see, the newer ones, the unburied ones, they show no signs of declining either. I have not removed an old and spent pseudobulb since I have this orchid in my collection. And to wrap up, they say size isn't everything, but when it comes to Stanhopias, size is everything. It is demanding, it is space consumption, but they are so, so worth it because they respond to the care as well quickly. And it is a rewarding experience to grow Stanhopias. And that, Nichette Butler, is how I take care of my one and only Stanhopia. If I had gone gung-ho in getting three stands in that one order I placed as I had planned, <laughs> I would be in trouble space-wise. Now that I only have one, I am making sure to grow it into whatever it wants to grow into. <laughs> or out of. <laughs> Speaking basket. So far, <clears throat> we can still see the basket. <laughs> uh, maybe an update in two years and we'll be like, there was a basket in there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, I hope that this video was helpful to anyone who watched it. Nichette Butler, I hope it was helpful to you. I thank you for watching the video. Any questions with more environmental details tailor-made to your climate, let me know in the comments and I will be happy to elaborate. Meanwhile, Stan the Man and I wish you a fabulous day, for I will attach a condition to that, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye. <laughs> While it is a beautiful sunny day, I do have to add this right at the end of the video because things have happened since I last filmed the Stan Hopier footage and I was confidently talking about the temperature tolerance of my Stan. Well, Persistent cold weather has crept in and I want to show you cold damage. So the five degrees Celsius lows that I've been so proud of that this orchid could withstand have actually shown some cold damage. However, it was a persistent week 10 day cold nights in a row that this orchid couldn't withstand it can handle a night or two as long as it is nice and sunny the next day to warm it up again but not what we've had recently so i wanted to make mention of that seeing as the video hasn't aired and i'm still working on it i figured this information is important because i was confident the orchid was holding out she cannot withstand the low low temps over a considerable amount of time which is a shame because because when the cell damage will come through, the orchid is going to look so much tattier and well. That is just the name of the game here on the patio. Anywho, know that there is a limit to temperature tolerance with Stanhopias if the temperatures are persistently, consistently low. A couple of nights won't hurt them. Thank you for watching to the end.